All right, we are now recording. So welcome to What's an OER Sprint Anyways, and we're all here to learn from our esteemed panelists, all of whom have extensive experience with open educational resource sprinting. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment uh, to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Emily Carlisle, who is the digital program lead here at eCampus Ontario. Uh, Lindsay Woodside, who's the program manager for Ontario Extend at eCampus Ontario. And Brandon Carson, who is the program manager at eCampus Ontario. Uh, all of us are from eCampus Ontario, but we do want to hear from, from you and we hope to feature more members of our community in our next uh, webinar. And again, I'm Lillian Hogan-Dorn, I'm the Digital Access and OER lead here. I'm responsible for our open library and our open library community, uh, which you're all a part of by being here today. Um, so I'm just gonna hand this off to uh, my colleague Emily to explain a little bit about what an OER sprint is and uh, what her experience is that all right are you all seeing my screen perfect so um, thank you Lillian as Lillian has said I am Emily Carlisle Johnston digital program lead at eCampus Ontario and in my current role I work a lot with educational technologies particularly giving institutions opportunities to dive in and explore emerging educational technologies but when I was first hired at eCampus I was editorial lead for our OER initiatives which means that I was involved in facilitating sprints with both Brandon and Lindsay and together our team ran, I think, seven sprints or something in three months with our business sprints focused on creating ancillary resources for two already existing open business textbooks. And our nursing sprints were focused on brainstorming and creating multi for three different OER that were created and then finalized before and after our sprinting activities. And throughout this flurry activity, we certainly learned our fair share of tips and tricks, a few of which I'd like to share today, but which I know Brandon and Lindsay will also share later on. So starting with what even is a sprint, because I certainly did not know before I got to eCampus Ontario. So as we define it, a sprint is a short time boxed period of time when a group of people work to complete a set amount of work. An OER sprint, of course, contains these same essential elements with the specific project or task being centered in some way around open educational resources. So at least in our view, a sprint is not a siloed event. It's not a term that we use when people come together to work on their own unrelated projects. And it's not a time to just try and fit in and accomplish as many things as possible in a short period of time. Rather, what makes an OER sprint successful is first focused and predefined goals and outcomes. Then those goals should be communicated clearly to all participants in order to achieve a shared understanding and ownership over those goals and those outcomes. And then finally, but certainly not to be overlooked is adaptability. You want your goals for the sprint to be focused but flexible, understanding that focuses or timelines might shift a little bit over the course of the sprint, and that's totally okay. So I wanna spend my time, or the rest of my time, diving deeper into each of these three points, sharing some of the lessons that we've learned in terms of how to achieve these elements of a successful OER sprint. So focused and predefined goals and outcomes. As and what do you need to accomplish? In conversation, I've heard and in our experience, we've learned that sprints can be a great opportunity to knock off some more of the more collaborative project elements, but also to work into busy schedules, some dedicated time to work on OER that sometimes we can't make time for in our everyday life. But choosing the right items for a sprint isn't always easy, nor is choosing the right amount of items for a sprint. So how then do you decide what the focus of a sprint will be? Well, I think this comes in part from understanding the work that needs to be done and how it will get done, because both understandings will give you a sense of how much of that work can be accomplished in the time that is available. And in our experience at eCampus, as folks facilitating the sprints but not necessarily diving in and doing the OER work, 
These understandings were achieved and then translated into our sprint focus by working with OER authors or the actual subject matter experts to define the focus. Uh, they were also, the focus was also achieved and translated into the sprint focus by reaching out to others who we know had run sprints with similar goals, like developing ancillary resources, which really helped us to gauge time required for all of those activities. And then this leads into my second point related to defining the focus of the sprint, which is prioritizing. If you've got a number of things that you'd like to accomplish related to the same OER project, determine which of those items is best suited for and ultimately needs to be accomplished during the sprint. In our experience, that really was the collaborative work. We thought that this was best suited for the sprints that we were running. So for example, brainstorming work, like laying out the chapters and the content for an entire open textbook, or in another case, determining what multimedia items were going to be built into each chapter in the text. Discussion work was also a really great fit. So in the weeks leading up to one of our sprints, all of the authors wrote their individual chapters and then distributed them to the rest of the group for review before the sprint. They then used parts of the sprint to actually build consensus around those reviews and then determine final edits that needed to be made. And then there's work requiring the expertise of groups of people, which we also found to be a priority to accomplish during the time of the sprint. Filming videos was one example. Um, and another great example was during our business sprints, where some individuals had side decks and some were more skilled at creating question banks or test banks. And yet building them in a collaborative space allowed the slide deck group to collaborate with the question set group. So that ensured that all the content that was included in the test bank was also represented in the slide decks that would then be used for teaching. So all of that is to say that it's worth it to determine not just what you want to accomplish during a sprint, but what can really only be accomplished in your sprint setting. And those priorities are the items that you should dedicate the most time to over the course of the sprint. Though that's not to say that the other items can't in some way get done. So as I mentioned before, having authors read each other's chapters before one of our sprints allowed for a really fruitful discussion during the sprint about final edits. And then there might be some other items that you can plan to accomplish after the sprints, but add on to the sprint agenda if there's um, at our business sprints, for example, one group finished their ancillary resources a bit early and then got a head start on editing another group's work, which is work that we'd actually planned to do after the fact. So basically, identifying your priorities allows you to be adaptable without compromising the main work that needs to be done during a sprint. And as I said before, adaptability is key. In fact, planning ahead of time to adapt as needed will allow sprint participants to stay productive and in high spirits over the course of the sprint. I mean, if there's really great work happening on something but you've gone over time, it would be worthwhile to let that keep happening rather than just jumping ship and then having a ta task left incomplete. But it also might not be. So you wanna be strategic about it from the onset by keeping adaptability in mind when you're planning before the sprint. So you can do that first by determining where you might be able to buy time when needed as you're building the agenda. And then second, by actually planning to have loose ends that need to be tied up after the sprint. We found that if you plan from the beginning to have some work that will be done afterwards, then that adaptability during the sprint is so much easier because you won't feel so bad if you don't have enough time left to complete something that was on the agenda. And of course, as we said before, knowing what's a priority during the sprint will make it easier for you to determine what you can afford to push until afterwards, if need be. And then finally, we said that shared ownership over goals and outcomes is a key element to sprint success, which really just means having all participants on the same page in terms of priorities to ensure that the sprint is focused and that all are in agreement if an adjustment of timelines or tasks has to happen. And we've found that shared ownership can be achieved in a few ways. The first being to include sprint participants in the sprint planning beforehand. Um, it can also be achieved by using everyone's strengths and expertise to the best of abilities throughout the sprint so that they all feel like they're really contributing to the end goal. 
But more than anything else, the key to this one is communication. Communication leading up to the sprint, communication at the beginning of the sprint, and communication throughout. But as I say that, I'm heading into what Lindsay and Brandon are going to talk about in their sections. So I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to talk about the logistics of sprints. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Alrighty, thank you so much, Emily, for that, uh, that great introduction, setting the stage and scope for today's webinar. Uh, as Emily mentioned, my name is Lindsay Woodside and I'm the program manager uh, with the Ontario Extend program here at eCampus Ontario. And uh, since May, uh, the three of us, Brandon, uh, Emily, and I have led and ran seven OER sprints. So we've been doing uh, a lot of sprinting, sprinting over here at eCampus Ontario. And from my perspective, this, this following list of, of 10 pieces has really been the, the guiding checklist, if you will, for the things that I consider to be the nuts and bolts or the, the nitty gritty uh, of OER sprint planning. So I'm going to discuss these 10 pieces uh, here uh, momentarily, and I hope that uh, I hope that you find them, them useful in terms of of really what needs to be undertaken in terms of the, the pre-planning that goes into um, into planning for a sprint. Uh, and please, if you do have any questions, uh, please ask away. So I'll start with uh, number one here. First things first, before you jump into being able to plan for a sprint, you need to identify the larger OER goal. Uh, and in our case, one of the uh, sprints uh, or OER goals uh, pardon that we worked on uh, was the creation of a health assessment OER. And so you can see here, um, again, the goal being the creation of an OER on the conduct of complete subjective health assessment, otherwise known as health history. From there, uh, the next step that you want to undertake is to draft and disseminate a call to participate in the OER creation. So uh, on this particular document, you want to make sure that you provide all the required information. So for instance, the time commitment, uh, compensation, if, uh, if that is required uh, or going to be dispersed rather, uh, the location of the sprint, any required skill sets that you're requesting, uh, a deadline to apply to participate, and also you want to make sure that you're very clear that um, participants will be uh, agreeing to openly licensed materials in the creation of OER. Typically when we've run um, uh, sprints or, or calls for OER creation in the past, rather, we've allowed a two-week application period, anywhere from a week and a half to two weeks seems reasonable. Uh, and then obviously sending this out to your networks, listservs, websites, and social media is obviously very important for recruitment efforts. Uh, lastly, uh, you might want to think in terms of the application process for participants, potential participants to uh, include a CV, a statement of interest that's aligned to OER generation. Next up, selecting the subject matter experts. So you put out this call and you hopefully get a lot of interest. So uh, perhaps you only need eight to 10 subject matter experts, but you know you have 20 appl applications uh, in the queue. So how do you decide who to choose? So we uh, in the past uh, have developed a rubric tied to the requested application criteria. Uh, and that would obviously be something that you would, you would create based on that. Um, we've found that assembling a team of two to three individuals to evaluate the applications is always helpful. Uh, uh, selecting participants based on the rubric scoring results uh, obviously is the outcome of that. And then notifying and confirming the successful applicants first, uh, wait till they confirm obviously, and then notify unsuccessful applicants. Next up, uh, depending on your role, um, in, in providing uh, human resources support, you may need to uh, source outside support to uh, human resources or finance department. Uh, and we recommend connecting with those folks as soon as possible, depending on your situation, as you may need them to assist with contract generation, perhaps there's an honorarium or con uh, compensation distribution that needs to take place, 
uh, afterward. Uh, they may uh, assist you with sprint location selection and also with, with catering. So in, in our experience, we found it very helpful to connect with our finance team as soon as we know a sprint uh, is in the, an OER sprint is in the queue. Next up, sprint goals. So again, um, obviously you've got the larger goal of OER generation already established, uh, but it's also really helpful to well in advance. Um, in our experience, we found that doing this in advance, um, although you know, is very helpful, we, we try to include uh, participants um, in that goals generation when we arrive at the sprint, but we find that it's really important to try and get those goals established in advance so that it can be somewhat collaborative, but it, it, it really helps guide because time is so sensitive in these sprints. It really helps guide the, the actual sprint if you have these established in advance. So you can see here, this is just an example of three sprint goals that we had for that health assessment uh, OER uh, that we were running. Okay, so sprint facilitation materials. So some things that you on your end might have to organize in advance could include the following. So slide decks, agendas, resources, uh, media waivers. So for instance, if you're taking pictures and, and wanting to tweet those, uh, maybe you wanna include feedback forms. For instance, if you have a weekend long sprint, um, what we've done in the past is uh, we've provided um, our sprinters with feedback forms um, at the end of uh, the first day of the sprint to, to, uh, to establish a benchmark in terms of, of what their thinking is uh, and if, if we need to uh, tweak anything for the next day. Uh, obviously, you need to prepare any onboarding materials that you need to send in advance to the sprinters, uh, technology preparation that may need to be undertaken. You might uh, also consider creating nameplates for the actual uh, sprint day of and uh, organizing any swag that you might want to uh, provide your sprinters with in advance. Okay, so uh, your sprinters are just about to uh, partake in a sprint. Uh, you're going to want to, um, I usually find, you know, anywhere from three to four days in advance, not too, too far out. Um, you'll want to send them some onboarding materials and preparatory reminders. So this typically, you can see the setup here, this typically is how we, we have undertaken that in the past. So we provide some FYIs around the time, a reminder of the location, any parking considerations. Uh, obviously, we want to introduce all of the contributing participants and subject matter experts that will be, that'll be attending the sprint. Uh, we might want to mention a laptop, laptop and other technology requirements. And then you can see some examples there of some must-dos and um, sprint prep. So uh, for instance, if you need them to do anything in advance, so like for instance, if we were having a sprint here at eCampus Ontario, we always ask um, participants to read our code of conduct uh, in advance. And then lastly, uh, sprint prep. So um, of course, time is sensitive in these sprints and you may request that uh, sprinters conduct some pre-preparatory work in advance uh, that will help, um, that will help uh, create a, a smooth, uh, smooth transition when you arrive um, at the sprint. Okay, so food services and catering. Um, so we recommend obviously trying to perhaps select a known caterer for uh, food, uh, for food items. Obviously, requesting dietary restrictions in advance is, is important. Um, in some cases, again, depending on how your finance structure works, you may need to acquire a quote and obtain a purchase order. Um, obviously, the food needs to be ordered um, and delivery needs to be insured. Um, if you're holding a sprint on a weekend, this is particularly important to make sure that um, a caterer can, for instance, access a location that you're in if, um, you know, if on a weekend if uh, certain doors and entrances are, are locked. And then that's always a good idea we found in the past um, to provide a cell phone number because uh, caterers have had to call us multiple times the day of. And then lastly, room setup. Um, so here are a couple of photos from the eCampus boardroom um, for uh, sprints that took place um, this year. So you can see here, um, that we don't have any of the food located in the actual rooms. So this usually is best, um, best put into a, a separate room. Um, you know, folks bring in, you know, light breakfast items and obviously coffee and tea throughout the day, but um, we found that the food space is better to be kept as a, a separate space. 
But you can see here, this is just an idea of how you might want to set up the room. So um, we've got some swag bags in these pictures. We've got nameplates. We've got folders with all the required information, including agendas. We've got writing utensils there, pens, sticky notes. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right-hand side, we've got some parking lots um, set up uh, as well um, in, in the room. So uh, that's, that's the list, my checklist of uh, my top 10 items in, in terms of the, the nitty gritty of how to pre-plan uh, for a sprint. And I found that um, uh, as the seven sprints that we've run throughout this year have, um, that the ones that we've undertaken, uh, that these um, following these pieces and, and following this checklist has been incredibly helpful to ensure that the goals of the sprint are met when we actually get to, uh, get to the day out. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Brandon now, uh, my colleague, uh, who's going to discuss the um, the day of and what actually uh, is uh, occurs uh, during. Hello everyone. Just going to load up my presentation. All right, my name is Brandon Carson and I'm currently on a leave from Durham College where I'm a learning technology specialist in the Center for Academic and Faculty Enrichment. Professor. Uh, when I first joined eCampus Ontario, I was a program manager for the Business Open at Scale OER project. And now I am working with Adaptive Technologies at eCampus Ontario. I will be speaking about my experience on what occurs during a sprint after all the hard work that Lindsay just discussed is completed. After all the preparation was put in place, the big day arrived. We had sprinters attend our sessions and completed work on site at eCampus Ontario. Although there are many different shapes that can occur with a sprint, I'll be providing real examples from our business OER sprints that occurred over the summer. Lindsay will happily provide her expertise or her experiences of running sprints for tests and nursing during the Q&A session if anyone has questions. As guests arrived on site, we started off with an icebreaker to allow participants to get to know each other better. This helped everyone relax before starting our day. Although we had overall project goals coming into the sprint, it was important for our sprinters to be part of the goal creation process too. Excellent suggestions came out of these discussions, including ensuring that the material was written in a simplistic language to benefit individuals whose first language may not be English. Emily, our on-site expert in copyright and style, provided an overview on open licenses and the style guide that we would be using for the project to ensure consistency in the work completed. We then provided an overview of OER to the educators in the room before collaborating on the ancillary resources we thought would be most beneficial to faculty members. Luckily, we had the opportunity to connect with leading OER experts before our sprint to provide suggestions based on these experiences from their past OER ancillary resource sprints. From these discussions, it was decided to create test banks, slide decks, and mini case studies. As you can see from the screenshot of one of our agendas, the days were long and quite productive. We started our days with a group meal before separating into our teams and working on the ancillary resources. We ensured our teams had their own rooms to work in, as well as individual spaces set up throughout the office when a person wanted to work independently on a task. It was important to ensure that the technology that was required was put in place prior to the sprints. I would suggest having charging stations with multiple outlets, a dependable wireless internet connection, and having an additional monitor for sprinters to connect to. The additional monitor significantly sped up the development process as faculty referenced the textbook while completing slide decks and questions for the question bank. Aside from lunch and breakfast, scheduled breaks were not included in the agendas. This allowed individuals to work at the preferred rate and ensured that we did not interrupt an individual when they were on a roll. Each day ended with a wrap up to discuss what was going well and areas of improvement for the following day. This helped to address any issues for improving the workflow for the sprinters. While technical resources were important, Having supports for the sprinters was also imperative. Emily was available the entire weekend to support sprinters with questions around licensing and finding suitable imagery to use within the slide decks. 
Alina was our drill of all trades, stepping in to work on OER creation when numbers were not even and answering questions that educators may have. And finally, I had the pleasure of supporting the sprinters by keeping the project moving forward, providing any technical assistance that was needed, and reminding everyone the importance of taking breaks, having refreshments, and collaborating with their colleagues. With proper planning ahead of time, my job became quite easy while the sprinting occurred to ensure our educators had the enjoyable and productive experience. Here's a short quote outlining the experience one of our sprinters had. Not only were the OER going to positively impact students, they also had a positive impact on faculty. Ashley Marshall, who is a communication professor at Durham College, stated, since I started teaching business communications in 2014, I've used a combination of about 10 books for content. In three days, your OER sprint consolidated my material into one text, which is also free and digital. Following the completion of the sprint, there were additional tasks to complete for quality assurance. We had an external faculty member review all the material, had an editorial specialist make edits for consistent tone, and completed technical aspects such as ensuring the test banks work in all major learning management systems, and completed an accessibility review of the slide decks. In the end, the project was a complete success. We are pleased to announce that the development of these resources has resulted in additional uh, ad adoptions across six different colleges, totaling over $580,000 in projected savings for the 2019-2020 academic year. We'd like to thank St. Lawrence College, Loyalist College, Fanshawe College, Durham College, Centennial College, and Algonquin College for their adoptions and commitment to open education. We know a lot of other higher education institutions are currently adopting the use of these OER and center resources as well, and we're excited to see their savings numbers come in. In total, business programs have saved Ontario students over $750,000. While it was a pleasure working on this sprint, I must mention that the success of the sprint would not have occurred if it was not for the guidance from our peers who had already previously completed sprints, as well as the sprinters from the previous year that worked on Canadianizing two open textbooks. Their lived experiences were significant in our planning and implementation process. Now over to Lillian to discuss the Q&A portion of this webinar. Okay, thank you guys so much for your thoughtful contributions and for such well-prepared slide decks. Um, we really, really appreciate it. So um, we're going to move into the Q&A very shortly. Um, I have a couple questions myself. Um, so I'll ask a question to all of you. And just a reminder to anybody participating, um, we have been trying to answer questions as they come in live in the Q&A. Uh, but you'll see at the bottom of your screen a little button that says Q&A. That's where you can add questions. Um, and upvote other people's questions and um, that'll help us keep track of all your questions and we won't get them lost in the chat and make sure that we answer everything uh, that we can. Uh, and yes, Anita, a recording will be available. <laughs> okay, um, so a question from, from me. I've had the pleasure of attending some sprints facilitated by these lovely uh, folks. Um, and I was just wondering from each of you, what is the one thing that you wish that you knew before your first sprint that you know now? I can take that question first, Lillian. So one of the most important things that I learned after running the first Sprint Dirty Campus Ontario was the importance of being a good timekeeper. So it's great to uh, encourage discussion amongst sprinters, but um, you really, as the, as the ringleader, need to ensure that you're, you're keeping time with the agenda items. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I at some points was even annoying myself with how many times I would, uh, you know, encourage folks to, to get back from a, a break, for instance. Um, uh, you know, I just I sounded very repetitive, but it really is, I, I can't stress the importance enough of ensuring that you maintain uh, time uh, because again at the end of the day uh, you know folks want to leave when you if you if you've run a sprint and you say that it's done at five o'clock uh, chances are they're not they're not uh, necessarily willing to stay stay past five right so you want to make sure that you're you're keeping good note of the time to ensure you reach your sprint oer goals Yeah, um, I think one of the things, I mean, I definitely agree with Lindsay, but another thing that we really learned um, across the business and the nursing sprints is, you know, a, a discussion with a whole group is really, really great and can be really, really beneficial. But when it gets down to actually wanting to do the work, I think breaking people into smaller groups and allowing 
um, those groups of sort of targeted expertise or where you know the expertise is disseminated across the groups uh, can be really helpful in order to actually accomplish tasks and get things done. And that's something that we did try to do um, throughout the course of the sprints is, you know, have some time for everybody to be together and talk about how the day is gonna go or come together at the end of the day and um, debrief or even throughout, but then to break people into different groups um, when we really needed to get things done or was I think a very uh, a productive way to approach it. One thing I wish I would have known was the importance of keeping energy up. So the sprint that I ran was a three-day sprint. So uh, first day, no problem. Second day, a little towards the end, people were getting a little tired. But by the third day, you could tell that uh, it was starting to become a little bit draining. So making sure that we had stuff in place to keep them energized. Uh, some options there are always coffee, but uh, candy was something that came up. So that was something I wish I would have known ahead of time and come prepared with uh, for the event was more candy. I was able to go get some chocolate bars, but it would be nice to plan that out ahead of time and get something a little bit nicer for the sprinters. Great, thank you guys so much. So I'm just gonna highlight some questions that have come in over the course of the, of the session, and they've been kind of answered in the Q&A, but I, I'd like to give you all a chance to elaborate on that as well. Um, so my first question that I have uh, was from from Jess, um, and she was wondering about some budgeting estimates for sprints. Uh, and she said, uh, because we're less formally organized and might not have much funding to allocate, can I don't uh, bribe people to participate with goodwill, coffee, and candy? So I'd love for each of you to speak on your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, I think so if you're working, for example, if you're already working on an OER, um, say you've already got a group together and you're building it, an open textbook and you decide that, you know, it would be really productive to get some people, get this team together um, throughout the sprint or to get some people together in a sprint setting to accomplish some of those tasks that you know it would be great to work together on then i think uh you absolutely can do that with candy with um with candy with coffee with whatever i mean i think that if the team's already there and uh, then absolutely bring them together i also think something that maybe something that we learned um, over the course of the sprint is how productive it also is to have students involved and i think you can definitely bribe students with coffee and with candy and if you have a few dedicated um staff or persons or subject matter experts then that would totally work as well um, and you bring the coffee, you bring the candy, and then you bring the good conversation or the energy, and it can totally be um, a, a productive and energetic and fun time. Yes, um, thanks for your question, Jess. So um, I agree with Emily. Uh, I think that there are certainly creative ways that you can incentivize participation in a sprint if, you're, if your funds are limited. Um, so, you know, just by virtue of participating to participate, right, um, to a larger goal of, of contributing to an OER, um, but certainly if, if funds are limited, um, uh, you know, perhaps there are certain um, funds that you can apply for uh, at your institution that might allow you to uh, provide small incentives such as, you know, gift cards up for grabs or um, snacks. Obviously, food is key. I mean, I, I don't, um, I, I think it's, near impossible to to, have, to run a sprint without providing refreshments like you do need to uh, account for that in some way and, and where that funding comes from I guess is just based on the you know the creative opportunities you can look for within your institution to try and um, acquire that the only add-on I would have to that is to also look into seeing uh, it's possible to be swifted so in the Ontario college sector you could look to see if you could be swifted hours to be working on your OER creation, as well as including it into the curriculum to have students uh, support the OER creation as well. Excellent, Brendan. And I think that really addresses, uh, Trisha has a question in here, just wondering if anyone has done a sprint on their campus. If so, were faculty compensated or were, uh, was there swifts? Um, so, and if anybody has, uh, has done that, uh, has done a sprint on their campus, you could just uh, raise your hand in the 
the chat and I can, uh, Anita, I can unmute you if you'd like to speak a little bit to that. Sure. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we did a sprint here at Virginia Tech with uh, nine or 10 faculty in business and created a test bank with them over the course of a day and a half. Um, it was the most fun thing that I did last year and I'm planning to do another one this year um, that will be a little bit different. We're still working out what that is. Well, and um, were your faculty compensated in any oh, way or did they receive yes. time? Yes, um, the faculty and everyone who participated was given an honorarium. Um, it's really hard to pay people here at your own institution. So people at our institution, unfortunately, got professional development money instead of money that they could put into their own bank account, do whatever they want with. Um, but our, our honorarium was, I think it was $250 US. Um, we had three or four librarians also involved and I felt like it was really important to be equitable and I really pushed so that they would also get an honorarium because they were also working. So um, we were able to do that and um, yeah, it was really, it was great. Okay, thank you so much, Anita. I'm gonna switch it over to uh, Clint. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Um, so I can just talk a little bit about some of the experiences we had here at BC campus. I did a, uh, an open textbook sprint back in 2015 where we created a geography, a regional geography textbook in four days uh, with five faculty members um, and, and about a half a dozen support staff. Um, uh, talking about the finances, we had a budget of $30,000 to do the textbook. Uh, which was quite in line with what we were um, um, giving to um, to other projects that were creating textbooks. Uh, and we did come out at the end of four days uh, with a textbook. Um, you might want to consider, and I wish I would have done more up front, was having a really good conversation around what an open educational resource is and Creative Commons licensing. Uh, and then having somebody on hand at the actual sprint that can vet all the resources and help people find openly licensed resources. Uh, we had so many times where, where people wanted to use some copyrighted resources within the textbook and um, you know our goal was to come up with a completely open resource. So uh, we spent a lot of time uh, and it wasn't until the second day when I think the faculty that were there finally started you know kind of cluing in as to oh okay this is this is what we're looking for. Um, the other piece of advice I would have is have a graphic designer on hand to help with those ancillary pieces. They added so much to the textbook in terms of creating custom maps and creating more um, open educational resources that people can use outside of the textbook. So someone can come in and take the maps that we created and even if they don't use the entire textbook, they still have these resources available and those are open licensed. So in addition to creating the textbook, we also created a lot of the ancillary resources. So those are the two points I would add. Thanks so much, Clint. I really uh, appreciate hearing your expertise from uh, the West Coast. <laughs> um, and I think that's a that's a really, really great um, point. Uh, I know our panelists moved really quickly, but one thing that Lindsay did talk about was having a statement of interest specifically about OER so you could assess uh, people's understanding of OER and interest in OER uh, prior to the sprint and then plan to, to deliver that content um, up front at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna move on to a couple other questions. Uh, Kim has some questions about the extend module and we're lucky that Lindsay wears two hats, a sprint expert and an extend expert. So uh, Lindsay, is there an opportunity to uh, address the low budget by having a faculty or students earn badges and extend, um, perhaps like the curator module or something? Hold on, Lindsay, I'll unmute you. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, hi, Kim I, and, other, and all. I hope I'm doing your question justice. Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand it correctly, but um, I saw your second question, which was um, 
the usefulness of completing the curator module in advance. And I think that's a that's a great point. For those of you who are not familiar, um, and maybe one of my colleagues can drop the Ontario Extend while I'm talking here website into the into the chat. Um, but Ontario Extend is a professional learning program that uh, eCampus offers uh, that consists of six open modules uh, on route to becoming an empowered educator. And one of those modules in particular called the curator module, again, this material is all openly licensed, um, ha focuses on the curation of OER. And I think that that's a, that's a great point uh, that you've made there, Kim and, and Clint, I believe, uh, a great point to um, if, if sprinters time permitting uh, to uh, to complete that module or perhaps you can customize that module again because it's openly licensed uh, adapt it to suit your needs uh, so that sprinters in advance uh, can do some some free work in terms of uh, making sure they understand uh, what constitutes an OER and, and what doesn't constitute uh, an OER uh, when they're um, uh, amassing the uh, content uh, that uh, that goes into one. I hope, I hope I've answered that question um, correctly. And just to expand on what Lindsay said there, um, definitely having participants do some reading material, whether it's the, cre uh, the curator module, whether it's something that you customize is really helpful. And also um, just having some handouts, nothing fancy, nothing graphic designer like, but um, we did create some, you know, eight and a half by 11 handouts just to put on the tables um, so that participants had something to quickly refer to in terms of the Creative Commons licensing, I think, and then what, what an OER is or where to sort of find existing openly licensed photographs or um, videos or uh, other textbooks. And so I think just having those kinds of things that they need a quick reminder or a refresher on while they're working on the table is a really, uh, is really helpful. And we definitely saw that our participants were referring to those kinds of materials. Um, throughout. Great. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to a couple more questions, um, but I do want to get everybody out of here with time to make it to their next thing. So uh, we had a question from Trisha in the chat that I think is a really important question, and though Lindsay already answered it, I just wanted to read it. Uh, are part-time instructors able to participate in sprints? Hi there, yes, I can, oh, sorry, Brandon, you wanna go ahead? Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So uh, when we were running uh, the uh, Sprint Security Campus Ontario, uh, we certainly did not discriminate. So part-time, full-time instructors, uh, we had medical illustrators uh, in some cases, uh, staff from our institutions, so uh, frontline staff, uh, as well as students. Students, uh, believe it or not, um, and, and you know, showed, great interest in co-collaborating and creating these open education resources with their uh, instructors. Uh, and so to us, the more the merrier. And uh, as long as they were part of our, our member institution, uh, member institutions, one of our, our 42 member institutions, they were, they were welcome to, uh, to participate. Great. And I am going to combine um, two of Kim's questions to make it like one kind of a, a question. Um, so Kim had a question about, do you think that limiting to a two-day sprint at one time is the most effective? And then she also had a question about um, a follow-up sprint, or is it beneficial to come back and meet for a follow-up sprint after the initial sprint? So I was hoping you guys could each speak a little bit to um, the amount of time and the frequency of time that you find most effective. Yeah, happily. Um, I think it really comes back to what your goals are in the end to figure out how many days this is going to have to run over. So the first thing to be do is see what amount of work you want to get completed and figure out how many days that's going to take, especially by looking at how many people you're going to have in the sprint. So uh, Emily was gracious enough to look up that lucky number, which is seven, they say. Seven or eight people is kind of what you're looking for when you're completing these sprints, and that's what we had in the room when we were doing ours. Um, you're going to want some additional people in the room as well uh, to support with instructional design, uh, technology, copyright, and uh, designers is another good thing to have as well. But uh, eight, seven or eight subject matter experts is uh, great. 
Yeah, I think just like Brandon was saying, um, and it, it really does depend on your goals and whether you've got those uh, items that it makes the most sense to accomplish um, during a sprint and sort of what your timelines are. So, I mean, we did the business sprints over, uh, over a weekend and that was enough, but we did have some follow-up work after the fact, like the editing, like um, polishing and accessibility checks and that sort of thing, but that could be accomplished by individual people sort of in their own um, work environment. So we didn't need to do a follow-up sprint. Whereas with the nursing, um, we had one, we had like a one day sprint at one point and then maybe a few weeks later, I think we had another sprint. And the reason we spaced them that way and did them as follow up things is because there was some work that could be accomplished in the meantime individually, but then we felt like we needed to wrap things up and film videos or uh, create some other materials in a collaborative setting. So we had that um, final follow up sprint before we wrapped up the whole process. So I think it's really just um, gauging what what your goals are and what your own timelines are like to in order to sort of determine how long and how frequently you should be meeting in this sort of setting um, and environment. And I'll just mention, I think it's one of the things that I might have glossed over in the pre-planning for the sprint is yeah, really ensuring that you maximize that face-to-face -face time because it's highly unlikely, again, if you have a group of seven to eight sprinters who are coming from different geographical locations, getting them in a space all at the same time again and being available, uh, you know, may be difficult. Uh, so just ensuring uh, that you maximize the face-to-face -face time that you can get everyone together. And then obviously Zoom meetings um, may be helpful. Uh, virtual meetings may be helpful afterwards uh, in place of an actual face-to-face -face sprint. Great. Uh, thanks so much. So we're uh, running a little bit low on time. Jess, I'm going to answer your question in the chat and, and about the open library peer review process. But I have one more question for all our panelists, kind of a fun question. Um, you all uh, noted that you had time for like a, a group meal and an icebreaker at the beginning of each of your sprints. What is your favorite icebreaker to use uh, and uh, what's a really fun answer to it? <laughs> Okay, uh, this was one that Lindsay created. So I'm sorry, Lindsay, if you were gonna say this, that's why I jumped on first so you didn't take it. <laughs> um, but it was, what is your favorite ice cream flavor? And I liked this one because I learned of all these new ice cream flavors that I'd never even heard of, toasted marshmallow being one example. Then we actually went out and got toasted marshmallow a few weeks later and it uh, met or it exceeded expectations. So that one was really fun and uh, informative. Thanks, Emily. I'm glad you like that one. Um, of course, at the beginning of the sprint, you uh, you conduct your you know introductions and folks let you know where they're coming from and what their positions are. But one of the things that I find really interesting is to ask, uh, ask participants just those lighthearted icebreaker questions, their favorite movie, their favorite vacation destination, because I, I find that um, what individuals do in their leisure time is is really a reflection of of what they're bringing to the table as well. And so I, I like to hear sort of those those answers to those lighthearted questions that um, you know may seem fairly you know rudimentary, but nonetheless help shape uh, our our understanding of who's at the table. Mine came from my boss Lena Patterson. She uh, said to ask how people arrived at the sprint. I thought that was really neat because we had people coming from all over Ontario. So some people was as easy as a five minute Uber drive where others were taking a uh, five hour train ride. So hearing all the different ways people arrived uh, to our site was pretty neat. Great, thank you guys so much. And Trisha, I uh, will try to save the chat for after the, uh, the, the webinar is ended. Um, I'll do my best to remember to save the chat. Oh, and Jess has added all the links to the collaborative docs. Doc, so um, we will have those links. Anyways. Um, okay, so thank you all so much. Another huge round. I'm not going to applaud because, as you can see, we're all in the same room and it'll just kind of echo through all of our microphones. So, um, but a big uh, virtual round of applause for our wonderful panelists. I'm, I'm so very grateful to uh, each of them for their time and for their expertise. Um, and I have to say, I have had so uh, much fun participating in uh, OER sprints with them in the past. And I can't wait to participate in another one uh, in the future. Um, so just a quick note to end on, 
Uh, we have another community webinar topic TBD uh, in January on January uh, 14th, 2020 at 12 p.m. If you have an idea for what you'd like to see in this webinar, please uh, let me know. We really want these uh, webinars to feature the amazing work that you all are doing, all of our community members. So send us an email at open at ecampusontario.ca. As a reminder, this webinar is an initiative of the Ontario Open Library uh, Network, which is a community initiative powered by eCampus Ontario to steward the growth of open education at our Ontario colleges and universities. Uh, be sure to join us in our Slack channel uh, to continue the conversation after this hour is over uh, and to take a look at our community shared drive where we'll be dropping uh, any template resources that we have as well as the slides from from this particular uh, webinar related to uh, OER sprints. Um, and finally, uh, when the broadcast has stopped, you will be taken to a short feedback form. Please, please, please fill it out. It will help us uh, continue to make these webinars uh, exciting and uh, pertinent to you guys. So uh, once again, thank you all so much for, for being here and for sharing your lunch hour with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.